Hello. Hi, good hello, afternoon. Hello. Hello. Hi, it's a pleasure to meet you both. It is a pleasure to meet you. Um, I'm Anna Marie. This is Bonnie. I'm Bonnie. Hi, Bonnie. Hi, Anna Marie. Uh, Let me just change my name because okay. we just had an employee retreat, so they had us add things to our name. Anyway, it's a pleasure to meet you both. Thank you for inviting me. Well, thank you for coming. We appreciate it. Um, okay. Is this a, your dorm? Yeah. Yes, we're in our dorm room. I went to I went to, to college in prison, so we didn't have dorms. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so just to like give you a outline of what we're going to do today. So we're just going to be asking you some questions that I emailed you, and the Did call you? is recorded just for you to know. Um, so for class, we just have to make up a bio based off this interview and like what we learned from you. And when we come up, when we come together with the bio, we will be emailing you to um, see if everything is correct, if you're okay with it. And then we will be using it um, for class for our final reflection. Excellent. Okay. Um, to begin, so like, how has your life been so far? Like after um, being incarcerated, like how did you adjust? Um, like um, okay, I came home in uh, 2004, uh, October 6th, 2004. I think it was a Tuesday. Um, it's the type of stuff you remember. Um, um, I mean, look at me. Look, I'm a white guy. I was 34 years old. Um, I was coming home to an intact family. Um, they handed me uh, a, a debit card, said, here's your checking account. We already opened it for you. And there's a little bit of money in there for you. Um, in terms of support, there's, I, I couldn't possibly have had any more support, you know, and it was still hard for me. Um, um, I went away when I was 18. I was away for 16 years. Um, I, I essentially came home at the age of 34, having never been a free man, you know, in the mature sense, you know, I, I was younger than probably you two are when I went away. Um, so it, it was very hard to adjust to, um, to find my place in the world, to figure out what my role was going to be, you know, what I, I wanted to be. Everybody in prison, I mean, you got 16 years in prison, you spend a lot of time thinking about what you're going to do, but it's it's almost like you're a kid again, you know, like when you're a kid and they ask you what you want to be and everybody's like policeman, fireman, doctor, you know, mm -hmm. it can be that way in prison too, uh, especially when you are as clueless, you know, like as I was young, I didn't know what profession I wanted to be. So you, everybody builds something up in their head. I'm going to go home and I'm going to do this and I'm going to get this job and I'm going to do exactly that. And, and then, you know, you come home and life hits you in the face. It's never exactly the way that you plan. Um, you know, so, um, I, I am very aware of the advantages that I had and how difficult it was. And now if you, uh, you know, that's my story. So when I see guys that um, are coming home and trying to make the same transition and don't have an intact family here, don't have um, housing, you know, don't, don't have anything. They're coming home with what they had the last day that they were in prison. Um, you know, and, and for people, society to expect them to flourish, not ju I mean, not just expect them, but like demand it from them um, is it, really crazy to me. So, I mean, that that's obviously what drew me to this um, type of work, but I don't want to go too far ahead. Did I answer your original question? Yes, thank you. Okay. Um, yeah. um, how did you feel that housing in particular should be a um, essential aspect of the Hudson Links program. Okay, so you know Hudson Link is a college program. I mean that that that's why they were invented. Um, um, historically, starting in the '70s, um, funding through TAP and Pell in New York, we had college programs that were developed in many um, prisons around the state. I heard people say that there was a college program in almost every prison in New York back then. I'm not sure if that's true or not. But what happened is they took away Tap and Pell in 1994, and all these programs closed overnight. I was uh, I was in prison at the time. Um, 
Um, the college program that I was in was a very good program. It was Skidmore College. I mean, you know, it was a, a great college in a, in a really crappy facility. And they, um, um, what they did was pre-fund the classes that I needed to finish so that I could finish even after the funding was gone, right? So they build it all up front. I had like four classes left um, and I finished them and, and was able to finish my degree even after Tap and Pell were technically gone. So I say all that just to say that um, um, Hudson Link began uh, about four years later. So there was this gap where there was really nothing. And, and the first people to put it together and get private funding for college were actually the women in Bedford Hills Correctional Facility. Um, that, that put together this plan for, to have private funding and actually pay a college to come in. Maybe the college donates or waives some of their fees and get college back into the prisons. And the men in, in Sing Sing basically imitated them. Um, and Hudson Link was born as a form of imitation of what the women had done. So we started in 1998, you know, um, started teaching guys, started a maximum security facility where there, everybody there is doing, you know, long-term incarceration. So it was, it was several years before we had students start to come home, right? So it was probably, if we started in 98, it was probably uh, 2002 or three or four before Hudson Link students started coming home. So they started coming home in a trickle like that. And um, you fast forward to today, where last year we had 210 of our students released in one year, right? And that's the way it is now. So we're over um, we've been around now for, for 21 years and, um, 22, I guess. And, uh, um, we've had over 1200 of our students released. Now that doesn't all represent degrees, right? Not everybody has the opportunity to finish. College takes longer in prison amongst other things. You just don't have the flexibility to get the credits at the pace that you guys can, if you want to. Um, so it became clear over time if, if you're really interested in the well-being of your students, right? If you're engaged, not just in their education, but in their lives, if, you're, if, if you consider yourselves um, invested in their success, not just their educational success, their personal success, then you can't, you can't, um, you can't say that your job stops even with a degree, right? You, I, you don't just pat everybody on the back and walk away and say, hey, yeah, you got a degree, good job. You know, you got 20 more years to serve, good luck. You know, we don't do that. And, and um, it, it became clear that it, it I mean, it's, it, it's clear to, to me already having been there, but it became very clear that um, for all of our students, really the, the, the most critical juncture, the most critical transition for all of them is the transition back to society. Mm -hmm. You know, and you can, you can look at that from like, a transactional perspective, like, hey, I invested a lot of money in this person's education. I don't want to become a statistics. You can look at it on a human level that like, you know, we started our, our, our relationship as an educational relationship, but we're past that now. And, you know, I'm invested in your future. I'm invested in you as a human being and a person. I want to see you be the best you can be. And I think that's where we're at as a program that, that we really believe in our, our students. They're part of, we talk about it being a family as much as anything. So if you have family coming home from prison, you can't ignore their plight. So we started small. We started by collecting donated clothing, right? We have a lot of rich people on our board. Like how many, how many suits do you not need anymore? We focus on like business wear and, and we got them to donate a bunch of suits. And we, and we, um, we opened what we now call a boutique in the basement of our, uh, of our building, our offices. And so, um, you know, it looks like a little, it looks like a little thrift shop. You know, we have racks of clothes, um, men's and women's at this point today, um, hundreds of suits and um, to be able to bring somebody home and say, hey, you know, like, I know you just got home, you're not gonna go on a, a, an interview tomorrow, but when it is time for you to go on an interview, we're gonna make sure that you go on the interview feeling the way you need to feel, dressed the way you need to be dressed, check that box off. You don't have to worry about it. If somebody's talking to you about a job, you're going to be able to present yourself and talk to them as an equal, you know, and, and that is very reassuring to a lot of people, you know, in today's connected age, you have to be wired like everybody else, you know, you have to be connected. So we give a, a laptop to every Hudson Link alumni when they come home. It's old, it's an old used laptop, you know, we get them donated or we buy them refurbished. 
but it's critical. You know, everybody, the first thing they're going to do when they get home is get a phone and, and with us get a laptop. So, you know, you can't do everything on a phone. You know that, like, how would you like to do all your college work on a phone? So we started out there, but um, it, 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 it's very quickly obvious who needs help the most are the people that are coming home and don't have a place to go, right? So that that is about what the alternatives are. What are the alternatives if Hudson Link New Beginnings Program didn't exist? So the alternative is the, the shelter system, mm -hmm. right? But if you've ever been to the shelter, if you've ever been involved or engaged with that system, you know that the shelter system is really the front line of our public mental health system, right? The majority of people that are there are there because they have a mental health diagnosis. You know, th there's there's a percentage of people that, you know, it's circumstance or whatever, every, down on your luck, whatever. Those people tend to get resources quickly and get out of there. Um, but the, the by and large, the people that are involved in the homeless system are chronically involved in the homeless system because they're dealing with mental health issues. And in, in almost every way, the homeless system is geared towards assisting those people. Now you take somebody that's not there because they have a, a mental health diagnosis. And, and by the way, you know, mental health and um, addiction go hand in hand like mm -hmm. you know i mean it, it it's very rare to find somebody that has one and not the other yeah. in that setting right so you take somebody that's coming home from prison they are for example a hudson link student they've got their associate's degree you know they, they're they're uh 20 something credits from getting their bachelor degree they've been thinking about coming home for the last 20 something years having you know gone away when they were 20 years old now they're in their 40s late 40s or whatever it is coming back to the world and you're going to put them in that environment and say, here, fly, you know, take off, soar. It, it's just not realistic. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, you know, these are people that are there because of their circumstance, not because they have an inherent disability. Uh, in fact, I would argue that there's somebody that has demonstrated a willingness and um, an effort, you know, to succeed and to make an impact and, and, and to, to, do something with themselves and to handicap them that way was just heartbreaking to watch, you know. Um, I could go on and on about that stuff. So, I mean, that's what got us into this work and got us thinking about that. Um, so our, our solution at present was to um, buy a, uh, a dilapidated home, completely renovate it, mostly using our own students as labor right our own alumni that are home um, did most of the work and uh, we created at this point a single family home has five beds we can take five people out of the homeless system and give them shelter give them a safe place um, we, I mean one of the phrases that they use for this type of housing is a safe haven um, you know and uh, it's not really um, it's not like a supervisory model I don't have somebody there you know, I don't have a supervisor there. I, I myself personally go to the house like twice a week and check in with the guys. And I'd like to staff that out more so that there's more engagement with the guys, both to help them and to make sure everything is going the way it's supposed to. But um, that's our model. It's, it's, it's just about giving them a safe place while they figure themselves out. Again, we're, we are education oriented. So we're sensitive to the idea that some of our guys, when they come home, want the time and the space to focus on completing their degrees, right? So we have guys that are doing that. And some just need a safe place to get their feet under themselves, to get back into the job market, and, you know, and, and see what the housing market looks like for them. So, that, I mean, that's, I know that that's a very long answer, but that's, I took you down the path on like how we ended up here from being an educational institution. And the, the short answer to that is because, um, once you're engaged, you're engaged for life. We can't turn our back on somebody, you know, and focus on just their educational wellness when, when they're, you know, they're, as a human being, there's so many other facets to their wellness. Yeah, and I think that's completely wonderful what you guys are doing. Um, this really like lowers the recidivism rate for like, you know, these formerly incarcerated people potentially going back into jail. You guys are actually giving them homes and, you know, looking out for them. Yeah, that, that's our goal. I mean, if you ask, if you poll people coming home, they'll tell you that the most important factor to them um, that they would identify for 
um, a successful transition is housing. I mean, you know, a picture being in a homeless shelter, some of the homeless shelters are set up so that um, you don't have an assigned bed. You know, you show up by a certain time and they give you a bed. You show up after that, you don't get a bed. And the next morning, you and all of your stuff have to get out. Mm-hmm. And, and then start from there and go find a job. Like, what do you, you carry your garbage bag of property with you on your job interviews? Like, it doesn't, it's crazy. And that, most guys don't stay in that type of homeless shelter for long. The city, I mean, New York City is a very well-developed network, but um, none of them are good in the sense that none of them are a healthy environment that, that you really want to um, collect yourself and, and find yourself and, and move on, you know, and create the next version of you. It's, it's not the right place to do that. Uh, there, there are people that can do it, and they impress the hell out of me because I don't know if I could do it. Um, but um, I, I think it's unfair, yeah. fundamentally. Yeah, very unfair. Um, okay, let's see the next question. Well, you answered most of our questions. <laughs> uh, so how do you select the participants in the program? Um, um, we have an application process, right? So they fill out an application that's fairly detailed their background information. Um, um, and then we, uh, we have a counselor or a social worker um, who um, does uh, an in-depth interview with them. Hopefully it's in person. Right now it's usually over the phone or Zoom, you know, whatever it is. Um, we're, we're, it's still early in our program, like we haven't been around that long. So it's still been common for us to have applications from people that were in prison and could potentially be paroled directly to the house. Um, um, we have a guy coming home one week from today who will be paroled to our house, I hope. And um, he'll, he'll be, wait, the cat's about to go by. And um, <laughs> um, he'll be the, the fifth in person in the final bed in the house at the moment. And so after that, it'll be difficult, I think, moving forward for somebody to be paroled directly to the house. But about half of our guys were applying from being out already, and about half were still incarcerated. So um, the counselor meets with them ideally, or does a Zoom, or if they're still incarcerated, might just be a phone call, and does um, a comprehensive psychosocial background Mm -hmm. history on them and also uh, goes through the same criteria that are in the application, which um, um, to kind of draw out, you know, more details about who they are and what their resources are or not. So um, in our policies, we talk about um, priorities, right? So not necessarily qualifications so much as priorities. So we obviously prioritize somebody who falls into the definition of being homeless. Um, That can be tricky, tricky to really um, quantify even, you know, if I have somebody who, yeah, they have, you know, a great aunt that lives in the Bronx, you know, in a one bedroom apartment, but does that represent a meaningful alternative? Would that be viable or not? Um, you know, so it, it, that, that is less black and white than you might think, but we have a criteria for homelessness. So our priority in, in that, um, for that um, criteria is somebody that is demonstrably homeless, fits the definition of homeless. We focus, we have a priority for um, Hudson Link affiliation, right? So we define our alumni as, um, Kat wants to say hi, say hi. Oh, he's cute. Um, So um, theoretically we prioritize Hudson Link alumni then the next category of prioritization is other prison college alumni, right? We're not the only program in the state. And then theoretically, if we still had capacity, we would consider people, um, you know, in the reentry po- population that didn't have college experience. I don't know if we'll ever get to the point where we have that kind of capacity. So again, we express this as a, as a, um, a priority um, criteria. And then the third one is, um, um, time of length of incarceration, right? We'd like to serve people that have served more time 
um, if, if it came down to it than somebody who had served less time. Mm -hmm. And that's in many ways a proxy for um, resources, right? People, people that have served more time typically have less resources left on the street and also a, a proxy for need um, in the sense that of people that really need support when they come home. Like one of the guys in the house was only away for three years. And it's very clear to me that how much less impactful, and I, I, you know, I'm not, three years is a long time to take out of anybody's lifetime, but, you know, he's already comfortable with a, a smartphone. He, he still has connections. He still has employment connections. Like, you know, like, hey, I know I haven't seen you in three years, but we used to work together. You know, that still carries some weight for him. Whereas the I, other three I, guys that are currently in the house are like, you know, they've been away for 15 to 23 years. You know, there's nobody left that they can talk to that way. And I can, I can see how that's different. And I can see that this particular gentleman will probably flourish quickly, you know, and, and grow up and out. Whereas the other guys need more support. They need, there's more work that needs to be done um, to get a firm foundation under them, you know. And, and a lot of that is honestly um, building their confidence, you know. You're, you've spent that much time incarcerated. You've now been, um, you, you've really been socialized, so to speak, to that environment. And you have to, you have to, you know, like purposefully, intentionally redirect yourself when you come home to shed some of those behaviors, some of those mindsets, you know, that aren't really compatible with the free world. And that's a process, you know. So um, we, we prioritize guys that have been away longer uh, I say, guys, we're gonna we're working on a women's house, but I tend to say that as a shorthand anyway. But um, you know, we want to prioritize people that have been away longer uh, on the logic that they need the help more, right? Um, what are some of the rules you set for the participants of the program, and how do you how would you proceed if the rules in place were broken? I'm gonna um, I'm gonna open. A document on my computer just so I can reference it. Um, the rules are pretty logical, you know, like it's what you would expect. I mean, it's like uh, a little more, maybe a little more detailed than what your parents would tell you if you, you know, if you ask them for a list of, of rules to be in their house. But um, I'll run through them with you. Let me see. I don't know if you want to see this on the screen or not, but um, I just have to find my form. I thought it was in that form. Um, okay. So, um, the first thing to understand is that is that New Beginnings is a program, right? And participation in the program is what qualifies you for housing. So um, on that basis, if you, um, if for any reason your participation in the program is terminated, then you lose the benefit of the housing. It's a lot like a, a drug rehabilitation center or something like that. They, they all basically operate on that kind of model. And so that for us, um, there are a few core um, uh, program um, requirements. So one of them is that everybody will participate basically in case management. And so what that means is we have somebody that's going to help you with your case. What is your case? It's whatever you say that it is, right? So a case manager will meet with each person and say, what is it that you need to do? What is it that I can help you with? And what they formulate is called an individual service plan. And the, the by definition, Technically, every service that the person requires or, or articulates is from them, right? So, well, I need help um, getting um, connected to social services, right? I need to get SNAP. I need to get um, public assistance. I need to get Medicaid, um, you know, so connect with government services. That, that might be a typical one. It's very common for people to need um, uh, basic identification documents, um, uh, they're supposed to have that stuff before they're released, um, but it, that system often breaks down. So they're supposed to come home with a birth certificate and a social security card. Like the Department of Corrections tries to get a, a fresh new one for everybody while they're in there, but it doesn't always work or there could be problems. We had a guy come home and his birth certificate, instead of having his first name, just says male. 
which means that um, somebody never registered his, his name as it was given to him. So it's useless as an identification document because his name isn't male. So you now have to go through the steps to get it corrected. Um, so getting good identification documents is off, often a thing. So just to cut this short, everybody that's in our program obviously needs help getting to housing. So the one thing that's gonna be on everybody's individual service plan is um, um, finding uh, permanent housing, right? So the, the first item in the um, uh, agreement that everybody signs when they come into the house is all residents will formulate an individual service plan. Um, all service plans shall include at minimum a plan to obtain permanent housing independent of new beginnings, right? So everybody's on the same page that that's part of your program participation. So everybody's uh, residents are expected to follow the service plan and make progress towards their self-sufficiency to continue their stay. Residents um, should notify the, their case manager prior to missing any scheduled meetings. That's all basic. Uh, attendance and participation in community meetings is mandatory. So we hold a community meeting, all hands, once a week. Um, and that is a cornerstone of the program. So you, I, I don't expect anybody to miss that. Um, right now, in order to meet everybody's schedule, I actually go to the house at 7.30 a.m. on Thursdays and hold our community meeting so that I don't disrupt anybody's job search or work schedule or whatever. So, uh, you know, I do that to accommodate them. So if I'm going to do that, I expect everybody to be there. Today's world, if you have to do it by Zoom, that's fine. Sometimes you have guys traveling or visiting family or something, I'll send you a Zoom link. Meet, we'll hook up by Zoom, but you have to be there. Um, the next item that's on here is suspended right now for COVID, but it's all residents shall perform at least eight hours per month of community service within the local community, right? So um, the, the foundation of our program is, is building and rebuilding community, connecting, reconnecting with community. So that begins with the community in the house. It's one of the reasons that we have the community meeting that extends on the next level to our local community. We expect everybody to, to be exemplary citizens in the community. So we, uh, one of the things that we ask for is volunteer service. You know, um, but that's suspended right now. Be, honestly, most of the opportunities for volunteer service are closed right now due to COVID. So even if we wanted to, it's hard to. We did, we did do some work during the lockdown supporting uh, food banks and food distribution, um, but I'm not holding anybody to this eight hour requirement right now. Um, but that, that is something that we'd be doing if, if everything were normal. So, um, you know, drug testing is, is a real part of our program. So all residents consent to and are subject to drug tests at any time in whatever form is chosen by New Beginnings. Um, such drug tests will be administered at regular intervals and may be administered at every time, at any time. Um, everybody is supposed to be drug tested prior to being accepted in the program. And for us, this is a basic buy-in. You know, if we're going to do this, if we're gonna engage on this journey together, we're going to have some basic ground rules, and this is one of them. So drug testing is mandatory. And the idea isn't that if somebody, you know, came up positive that you're going to get thrown out. You know, a positive test to us is an opportunity for treatment. You know, so maybe that becomes part of your individual service plan. Multiple um, positives, that's an issue and could result in termination from the program. Um, so we asked them, um, everybody for a copy of their conditions of parole. These are the rules and regulations that parole personally gives to each person when they're coming home. In theory, they're personalized to you for your situation. In practice, they're very standardized. You know, they, every, they want everybody to take anger management and, and drug counseling. And it's like, I didn't have drugs anywhere in my record. It doesn't matter, they make everybody. Um, so we just want to be on the same page, you know, with uh, what parole expects from people. So it, one of the things that we can do is help them to get those programs, right? Help to connect them to those programs. Um, so, I mean, then you get into some behavioral rules. All residents are expected to show respect to all persons, regardless of their crime, race, religion, orientation, gender identity, disability, or ethnicity. Harassment, intimidation, or disrespect towards others will not be tolerated. Every person here has the right to feel safe living at, at New Beginnings. Um, we basically have a curfew that mirrors whatever their parole curfew is. Um, no smoking on the premises, no weapons on the premises, no drugs on the premises, 
um, prescription drugs. Um, we ask them to notify us of any pres prescription drugs they're in possession of, and we give them a lockbox to secure any um, like narcotic type prescription drugs so that they can make sure that they're safe and secure in their rooms. Um, most, uh, so the, the house that, that we run is three bedrooms. So two of the bedrooms have two men in them, right? One of them is a single bed, the other two have two men in them. So um, what we've done is uh, put a lock on the closet so that each person can lock their own closet if they want, which makes it, you know, it's basic. It's not going to keep anybody out, but it, it establishes a privacy boundary. And then in the closet, I, I, I attach to the wall a small lockbox. So if you had anything that was really of value, whether it's jewelry, money, or prescription medications, you have the opportunity to lock it up. You know, and, and that's a little bit another level of like security. Um, no alcohol on the premises. No residents shall be on the permitted on the premises while under the influence of alcohol or any illegal narcotics. Um, no pets. No visitors without um, notice to me. Um, um, and visits are, are only permitted in the common areas of the house. So they're not permitted on the second floor where the uh, rooms are, but they are permitted on the first floor. Um, and should only be during non-curfew hours. Um, no visitors permitted in the sleeping areas anytime. So food and drinks should only be in the kitchen dining room. Um, Personal property is limited to what can be safely stored. Uh, residents are not allowed to change or add locks. Um, there's standards for cleanliness, um, monthly bed bug checks. Um, and then, you know, rules for interaction with each other, you know, respecting other people's property, may not lend or borrow money or valuable property between um, program participants not going in each other's rooms without permission and the presence of the other person. Uh, shouldn't remove the house property. And then I, I basically wanted those to be the basic rules that guide everybody, but I didn't want to go to the level of like establishing a chore list. I don't think that should come from me. I think that for me, I should establish a standard. The house has to be kept clean. And then I ask the, the members in the house to establish their own house rules for how that will be managed. So the, the last item on here is that the, the residents shall agree among themselves and establish house rules, um, which should include, um, but not be limited to rules governing the chores necessary to maintain the cleanliness of residents in all grounds, preparation of meals and maintenance of the kitchen area, uh, the use and cleanliness of the bathroom area and any other you know, rules agreed by the residents. If they want like, you know, quiet time, after a certain hour or something like that. I think that's the type of thing they should manage themselves. But once they're established, I'm happy to um, um, help enforce them in the sense that all house rules shall have the same force and effect as the within rules. So if you guys as a community want to establish a, you know, a, a behavioral agreement, then I'm going to, once it's established, I'm going to help to enforce it, right? Um, and you ask for what are the consequences? So the consequences for basic rule violations like this is that the first occurrence is a notice to correct behavior. The second is a 30 day warning of termination. And the third is termination from the program. Um, that's a formal process if somebody was non-compliant with the rules. Uh, I, I reserve the right to um, remove anybody from the program at any time to preserve the safety and security of the program. So the only person that I've removed so far from the house was on those grounds. Um, and it was a complicated situation during the lockdown, dealing with you know, non-compliance with the lockdown rules, which you know, puts at risk everybody's health in the house um, and, and some other serious behavioral issues. So I removed one person from the house, but it wasn't through this process. Um, I want to backtrack for a second because you asked about um, how people are admitted. So I, what I, I, I didn't tell you the whole system. Once the counselor has interviewed people, the applicant, the counselor will write a report and the report will, will provide the psychosocial background. It will discuss the priority criteria that I gave you. So it will explain um, how each applicant falls on those priority criteria. And then um, we have an independent screening committee, right? So we have um, 
uh, people, uh, interested people from outside of our organization. One is an employee of Hudson Link, the, the other two are not. Um, and we actually just put a fourth person, so that it's actually four people now. Um, three of them are not Hudson Link employees, um, but we ask them to serve on the screening committee because they have some expertise in this area, some engagement in this area. So what happens is I hold a screening committee meeting about once a month. I ask the counselor to come and present each of the applicants. And then we have question and discussion and the screening committee votes on whether or not to uh, uh, approve an application. Getting into the house is a two-step process because you have to get your application approved and you have to get a bed. So getting your application approved puts you in the approved applicant pool. So that screening committee, that's not first come first serve. The screening committee then prioritizes that list based on the priority criteria to put the people that are most needy first, right? So even though you're the most recent person to be approved, you might be the first one to get the next bed. So the screening committee will um, vote on, on, on applications, establish the priority of the applicant pool, the approved applicant pool. And um, they also serve as a review committee for um, the third step of this disciplinary process to, for um, termination. So they also make that determine, they, they were the ones that would make that final determination in the context of just non-compliance with the rules. Okay. Are my answers too long for you? I feel like I told wow. you. No, you're very they're, detailed. They're, they're really good. Yeah. Okay. Um, so you mentioned before that you guys have like an agreement to how long they can stay in the house or like that they have to like find housing eventually. Yeah. So there is no set time limit. Like this is something that, um, you know, when we first talked about doing this work, the first thing that I did after I was hired is engage with other organizations that do this type of thing. So like all over the country, all over New York state, I talked to other organizations that are doing reentry type housing to uh, understand how they do it. And um, they're kind of all over the map. Most of them do not put any kind of strict limit, time limit on the housing and for, I kind of feel the same way because every person's situation is different. So I had a guy come home last December um, that needs five classes to finish his bachelor's degree. Now he can't get all five of them in one semester, which means he has about two semesters of work to do to get his bachelor's degree. Am I going to tell that guy you have six months to, you know, to find a house? No, I, I mean, we're, we are fully invested as an educational organization that, that, that we want to see that as the outcome uh, for him. So, you know, he's going to be in the house for a year to get those, you know, he's going to, he was in the spring semester, he's finishing the fall semester. By the time he's done with the fall semester, it'll, he'll have a year in the house. After that, I expect him, you know, you know to um, shift gears and look for what his permanent situation is going to be. But I'm not going to hound him for that year. So every individual's circumstances are gonna be different. Um, the gentleman that I mentioned that it was only away for about three years, I, I see him, he's already making moves, he's engaged, I mean, in a good way. So uh, how long is he gonna be there? I, I'd be shocked if he was there, for, you know, six months from now. I expect him to move up and move on. You know, he has, he has opportunities. Everybody's uncertain when they come home, but I think he's seeing that, um, you know, life isn't over for him, that, that, that um, he can pick up a lot of things where he left off, but he may also want to pause and decide if he wants to pick them up where he left off. You know, this is also an opportunity to change your path, change your direction. And that's something that I see him um, going through right now in his head. You know, that you can jump back into the same rat race that you're in before, and you know that you can pay the bills and you know that you can survive, but you've had this opportunity also to think about whether that's what you really want to do. And he might completely change gears. He might want to give up that career and become a barber. So that's um, what he wants to do. And that's, we yeah. want to support him while he does that. Yeah. Has anyone left from the house yet or? Yeah. So um, I removed one person. Um, we had one guy who was uh, rather remarkable. He was the first one in the house. He, um, he had served over 30 years. Uh, he came home in his late sixties. Um, you'd never know it looking at him. I mean, he looks better with his shirt off than I do. And uh, I'm telling you, he's 70 years old now. He looks like a, a bodybuilder. But um, um, his problem when he came home is 
who nobody wants to hire him, no matter what he looks like with his shirt off, people are, you know, there's age discrimination in hiring, especially in the types of jobs that we often end up in when we come home, whether we have a college degree or not, we very often end up underemployed, right? And a lot of that will be even in physical labor and trades. So we end up doing that because, hell, I'm willing to work. I know, you know, I was the whole time I was away, the state pays 15 cents an hour, you know, six hours a day, that's state pay when you're incarcerated. So, um, you know, that's just to say that everybody that comes home knows the value of labor and they're willing to work. So a lot of us end up starting at least with um, labor type jobs. So he came home and his problem was that he doesn't quite qualify for social security because that's based on your historical income and he's been incarcerated for 30 years. So he needed to work um, more quarters. Um, social security is measured in three month chunks and you have to have something like whatever, 40 quarters or something of, of social security taxes paid in to qualify for a benefit. So even though he was older, even though he's in his 60s, he didn't qualify for social security. He couldn't get into senior housing even though it was available to him unless he could demonstrate income. That income could be social security, but he didn't qualify for it. So for him, it had to be a job. And then, so now his problem was getting a job at his age. So, um, and, and he's a, a, a very smart guy. Um, he's very capable of even doing labor, but finding an on the books job um, that, that could get him over the hump to get into the housing and to qualify for social security was a problem. So he was in there for a little while. We finally, um, through a friend of a friend, got him connected with a good job. Um, and that qualified him to move into the senior housing. So he was, um, he wasn't the first one to leave, but he was the first one in the house. And then he's the first one that really went out on his own terms in the sense of, of going out into permanent housing. Um, another guy that came home was with us because he had no family left in this state. And what he really wanted was interstate parole. So he wanted to be transferred to another state. Parole had not done its, its um, legwork to do that process before he was released. They dropped the ball. Mm. So he had two options, to stay in prison or be paroled to a homeless shelter while parole um, processed this paperwork to transfer him to another state. And that's a two part process because New York has to, to ask for it. The other state has to grant it and then they do their paperwork and all of this takes time. So did he want to stay in prison after being there for 17 years already? Did he want to spend another couple of months that he didn't need? So um, he applied to us. He's one of our students and he was able to be paroled directly to us right at the beginning of COVID. I mean, he came home like March 7th or no, no, that was a Saturday. He came home like that first week of March and then the lockdown hit on like March 13th, right? Right around that time. So, you know, talk about um, culture shock, you know, to come from prison and, and come out and then immediately be hit with that was crazy. But uh, that was successful also. He got his parole approved. Um, he was allowed to fly during the lockdown and go down to Florida. So um, that was an adventure getting him on an airplane um, and uh, so that was a success also, but a little different than the older gentleman that I just mentioned. So those are the three men, men that have gone completely through the housing. Room. So one was removed, one was transferred to another state, one uh, um, rented an apartment. What's up? Yeah, for your snack? Yeah. yeah. You can I have two each? Oh, I'm sorry, kids. Um, what? Yes. Um, and so at this point, we have uh, four beds filled and uh, a fifth applicant um, has been approved and is, is like I said, going to be paroled uh, one week from today. So he should be the fifth man in the house. And then, and then after that, I expect to develop a backlog, you know, of, of people waiting for beds. So at that point, I don't know what it'll look like. I think it'll be unlikely that anybody will be paroled directly to the house just because timing uh, you know, you'd have to be really lucky for that to work out that way. So I think for guys, even in the future, it's going to be a situation where they um, have to be paroled to the homeless shelter while they're waiting. Um, you know, and that's, there's just, that's just the limitations of our resources so far. Yeah. yeah. Um, to backtrack, um, can you explain any skepticism like that arose while just trying to start the program? 
it was a lot of drama. Um, okay. <laughs> There was a certain amount of drama, but it was honestly mostly contrived. I mean, this is this is going to sound like a soap opera, right? So <laughs> the house that we bought had been vacant for seven years, and it looked like it. It was, um, the power was turned off, the plumbing was off, um, uh, the bank owned it. You know, it was basically an abandoned house that the bank had owned. And when that happens, the banks come in and they and they weatherize the house, which means they drain all the water out of the plumbing. They fill the traps and all the sink like kind of antifreeze that won't evaporate. Um, and they lock the door and leave and, you know, try and sell the property. But they don't, they don't want, they can't, if you leave it, if you don't heat the house, the pipes will burst and damage the house. And then, you know, you're a bank, you're trying to sell it. So this is what they do. They don't want to heat the house. So they turn off all the utilities and then they winterize the plumbing, weatherize the plumbing and leave it like that. So the house getting hot and cold and hot and cold, all of the paint just starts to peel um, with the humidity in the summertime. A lot of times the hardwood floors will buckle. And so, um, you know, we have video and, and, and pictures of this whole process. So the, the house empty for seven years, as you can imagine, was a wreck, right? And um, we didn't buy it from the back. What had happened is the neighbors to one side during this time period kept um, pushing the village to condemn the house because they wanted to buy it. They wanted to knock it down so that their house next door could have a bigger yard, could have a driveway, like they didn't have room for a driveway, you know, whatever. So they, were, they had some self-interest. So then um, it was bought by a developer. So he wanted to renovate the house and actually intended for it to go to his daughter, right? So he bought the house for his daughter and um, was going to, you know, completely renovate it inside and out. And the same neighbor just initiated a, a campaign against him and the work that he was doing, again, because I think they wanted the house. They wanted the house to not be renovated. So they, they tortured this poor guy. I mean, they made it. They, they were making reports like daily to the building department saying he's doing this, he's doing that. Uh, there's poisonous air coming from. Meanwhile, the neighbor on the other side is like, great, wonderful. I'd love to see this house renovated, you know, and didn't have any of the issues that the first neighbor allegedly had. So um, he gave up. The developer gave up, not, not because he didn't have the determination. He did. But his daughter, because we know these people. The daughter at one point said, Dad, I don't want to live next to these people. Yes, so like, we're well. going to build this house. And why do I want to live next to these nasty people? Mm -hmm. So um, he decided to sell it. So we pop up on the scene, not knowing the backstory. And we're like, wonderful. This is kind of what we're looking for. We want to take something that's bad and make it good. Again, going back to community building, right? The whole program is about um, building and renewing community. So let's take the house that's the worst house on the block and make it beautiful, make it the most beautiful house on the block. Um, and I think we did that. And, um, you know, so we stepped right into the middle of this. So he was happy to sell it to us. And then, you know, as soon as we started doing anything, like the neighbors just popped up like, hey, you know, your tools are too loud, you're this, you're that. Mm -hmm. And they'd call the building department. And, and then, you know, it kind of leaked out what this backstory was. So as soon as they found out, yes, as soon as they found out that the goal was, um, you know, what our program goals were here, because um, we didn't publicize it, we didn't put a sign out front, you know, like, you know, transitional housing coming soon. Yeah. Um, um, they just went on uh, a whole like disinformation campaign like against us. So we're, we're like 500 feet from a school. They were telling people we're gonna house sex offenders and we're right next to a school. Um, in fact, it's the opposite. Because we're close to a school, parole itself would never allow a sex offender to come to our residence. They, it's their own rules bar it. So, you know, actually that meant that even though we have, uh, we do definitely have students that are, um, have sex offenses or, or are gonna be, have to register under the Sex Offender Registration Act, they would never be allowed to apply for this program because of that. So, um, you know, they tried to stir up people going to, because the school happens to be like a preschool. So it's like pre-K and kindergarten. So they're, you know, trying to scare the parents, you know, pamphleting them, you know, murderers are coming to the neighborhood. And um, they were able to raise a certain amount of ire. I'll be 
I'll be honest, the village never wavered in their support for us. The actual village administration um, was behind us and having knowing the history of this family relative to this particular property, they knew it wasn't even really about us. Mm -hmm. um, and what happened is uh, towards the end of our development, they actually bought another house and moved away. So all of these other parents, you know, from the community that they had rallied, they just ghosted on them. Oh, yeah. <laughs> they, they moved all the way to the other side of town. It was like, yeah, we know that you're going to go to the meeting and complain, but we don't have time to do that now because we have a new house and we're not coming. So the parents were like, what the hell? You know, you're the ones that we're here to support you. And then as soon as it's not a personal issue for you, that all of that stuff just died. None of it. Um, we've been open for a little over a year and haven't had any issues whatsoever um, in that regard. So there was some drama, <laughs> but it, it blew over. That's the short answer. That's great. It's always, you know, you're always going to have your little bumps in the road. Yeah. M meanwhile, I have to say the neighbor on the other side, woman lives alone supported us from the first moment i think what you're doing is great um bring it on you know how you know i mean you know like she used to let us because all of our utilities were shut off so she used to let us like use the hose when we were mixing cement and stuff like I, you, you know you couldn't have had a more different experience on the left side of the house from the right side of the house and it's just crazy the way people are yeah. um but uh I think I think that we've made our case, you know, here that that we're not a detriment to the community, and I hope we've made our case that we're actually a benefit to the community. I wish that we were doing our volunteer service hours, you know, because I want to be able to document that. So when this issue does come up, I could say, well, you know, last year this house provided 1,000 community service hours. How many did your house provide? You know, for the community, for the betterment of the community, volunteer, no charge. We were out there helping everybody you know what i mean i want to be able to talk about that so i'd love to get back to normalcy like we all would i guess yeah yeah for sure um so who pays for like the utilities in the house like how are the bills and you know everything else taken care of the heat light gas 100 percent of the bills um, are paid by us um uh, again because we're a newish program still, there are program facets that we've talked about implementing but haven't yet. Um, I think that if somebody's working, it's perfectly reasonable to expect them to reimburse. Yeah. So um, I have, I actually have a rule on the books that says if you're working, that you should contribute the lesser of $400 a month or 20% of your pay as uh, what I call a subsistence payment which is basically reimbursement for the household expenses. I haven't charged anybody anything yet. So everybody that's been there so far lives 100% free of charge. Um, I don't, I don't, I, I've been engaging in conversations with like our legal counsel um, in terms of how to best structure that if we do start charging the subsistence payment. I, I, I think that it's reasonable to do it. I think it's, um, um, I think it's realistic, you know, to, to, to ask somebody to contribute, you know, to their, um, to their upkeep and their well-being. Um, so again, I just think it's, it's another kind of buy-in, you know, that, that is reasonable to expect from the residents and is reasonable for them to expect, you know, their next step is gonna be paying rent to somebody exactly you know, so, so their responsibility yeah that's that's kind of the goals of it but in practice we haven't done any of that yet um if you just came home i don't expect you to give me anything if you're living on public assistance and, and food stamps like chill you know yeah. under you and and you know we'll, we'll we'll circle back to this when it's the right time mm -hmm. you know and you know there's a couple guys in the house right now that work enough that they would probably be making that payment if it were in place and there's a couple guys that aren't in that position yet, you know. And so you want you want to let them find their feet. Of course. Yeah. Um. So the materials used to renovate the house, like how did you guys get them? Were they donated? Oh, that's a good question. A blend. You know, we bought a lot of stuff, but so much stuff was donated. Like you know, I I have some background in in um. 
I'm a weird person in the sense that um, they they hired me basically to renovate the house, but also put it on me to create the program and also do some other things for Hudson Link itself. So I wear a lot of different hats. And, and so I have some experience in the building industry and, and you know, I'm, I've, I've done, worked on renovating houses before. And, you know, you're used to, you know, going to Home Depot or Lowe's or, or other supply houses and buying stuff and arguing over prices and stuff. And then my experience in doing this job, um, you know, where you go places and talk about what you're doing and they say, well, how can I help? You know, what can we do? And, and my boss um, is great at like selling the story, you know, so he calls these people and talks to them and we got so much stuff donated. Like it's such a different experience doing it in this context where, you, you know, an electrical supply house in the city donated all of the materials for the electrical rough in. That's like six or $8,000 in wiring and the little boxes that go inside the walls and the circuit panel in the basement and the hi hats or the lights that, that are, you know, embedded in the ceiling. They donated all of that free of charge. The hardwood flooring, there's hardwood flooring throughout the house was donated by a developer free of charge. The rock was donated. The kitchen cabinets were donated. The, the refrigerator was donated. Um, all the appliances I believe were donated. Um, the countertops, they only gave us 50% off. Eh, okay. um, um, all of the furniture, except for the actual beds that the men sleep in was donated. Um, we had our own board members. Like we, we get a lot of, especially once the people heard that we were doing this type of work, we got a lot of um, housewares donated, right? So I had, I had, you know, like a whole bunch of plates and glass and cups and, and stuff. And one of the board members came, she said, I want to come. I heard you guys are getting ready to open. She came and she opened the cabinets and she saw the plates weren't all the same. And she went to like Home Sense or Marshall's or something. And she came back with like all new stuff. She's like, no, I want everybody to have you know, matching plates match. I want them, in other words, she wanted them to, to not feel like anything was second rate when they were there, not feel like anything was a second uh, second thought, you know what I mean? So um, um, she was a Hudson Link board member. So this was essentially a donation. She, she bought the silverware, plates, glasses, um, some other basic, you know, stuff, you know, like chopping knives and, and spatulas and stuff. She bought all new stuff, came back. It's like, this is what I want them to have. I'm like, God bless you. <laughs> then that's what they'll have. Um, so it, it's really, you know, amazing. Uh, the, the dining room table and chairs were donated by a, a, a local gentleman who's on the New Beginnings own board, right? So New Beginnings is a subsidiary of Hudson Link. So there's Hudson Link and they have their board and New Beginnings is owned by them in every sense, but we have our own board. Um, so one of the guys, gentlemen on the New Beginnings board donated his dining room table and chairs, which, you know, he had only owned for 50 years and raised his five kids at that table. And that was the first table we had in the house, you know, was his. Um, so, you know, a lot of that stuff is, is really cool um, to be involved in that and to see that kind of generosity. There was a lot of generosity displayed in that house, not the least of which was the purchase of the house. The house was purchased outright by a donor for us. Wow. So um, when you asked about our upkeep, our upkeep is essentially insurance, taxes, and utilities, which in the grand scheme of things is not that expensive. You know, you could, you could probably maintain that house for maybe $2,000 a month, maybe even less. You know, so that's not a big uh, maintenance cost to keep the place open. Mm -hmm. that's, that's great. Um, what do you envision for the future of this, com um, for this program? Sorry. You know, I don't know. I, um, it's an excellent question. One of the things I, I would like, to, what I would love to do, what's most important to me, is to make sure that you're doing what's needed, right? And I think that there's, there's definitely a need um, for this type of transitional housing, but it's important to me to make sure that that is not just speculative. It's not just anecdotal. You know, I know that people coming home, some of them need housing, but you got to go further than that when you're developing programs like this and really investigate what the um, what the issues are, what the statistics are, who your service population is, what are their characteristics, what are the rates, you know, and because you want to know where you can 
have the most impact. Like one of the things that I say so often about this program is that a little bit of resources at just the right time goes a really long way. If I can give somebody housing for five or six months when they first come home and that changes their life, I mean, what's the investment there? You're talking only about a couple hundred dollars a month, you know, once you have the house in place, you know, you're not, but how impactful is that for the individual? It's huge. It's really huge. So I wanted to look at what the best ways to do that are. So moving forward, we already own a second building that we call the women's house. Um, it has a name. Uh, it's, it's, we call it Moe's house because uh, the first employee of Hudson Link was a woman named um, Maline Mohammed. Um, so everybody called her Mo. And she ran the program in Sing Sing when that was the first and only program that we had. Um, she has since passed away. And um, she really, she really left a huge mark, you know, on, on the Hudson Link community and um, so many other people, even outside of Hudson Link. So um, our donors want to name the house Mo's House. So Mo's House will be our first house for women. Uh, it's a two family house, which allows us to house, we hope up to nine women there when it's completed. And we're just in the process of doing those renovations now. We're just starting the renovations. So, um, you know, that's a future expansion that's already on the books, is already gonna happen. But beyond that, I'm not really sure. I think, I think that ideally we should be in, if we wanna do this type of housing, it shouldn't be a one family house like our first project, it's better for us to be in a two or three family house. Um, we didn't talk about why the program is structured quite the way it is. For example, in the first house that we're in, I could fit more people in there. I have a fully finished basement. I could put two more people down there. I could have seven people in that house. And the reason that I don't do that, even though the space would allow it, is that at that point, I would need permission from the village. And now the asking permission from a village makes me um, beholden you know, to them. Um, I have to follow whatever rules or restrictions that they might impose. And they, and they certainly could very well say no, um, because as long as I'm below five people in the house, the, the rule that they, the village has, which is very common in New York, especially this part of New York, what they don't want are what they call illegal rooming houses. So how do you determine whether a house is a rooming house or a family? So they actually have a definition of family on the books. And so a family in Ossining can be up to five unrelated people. So as long as my housing unit has only five unrelated people or less, I don't have to ask for permission. I am operating a single family home with a single family in it. And yeah. it doesn't matter if they pay, you know, any payment for their bed or for, you know, reimbursement or anything, that doesn't change the fact that as long as it's five or less, I don't have to ask permission, mm -hmm. right? So the sweet spot is probably a two or three family situation where you can get four or five people in each housing unit. Um, so I think that's a better model um, moving forward if you want to continue to do this type of work. But I think there's also a need for the next level of housing, right? So, so what would be the next step of housing look like for uh, most of these uh, men and women? Um, and I think you're looking at like a, a studio or one bedroom apartment that is um, potentially subsidized, you know, it could be like Section 8 housing or, or something else, you know, some other type of housing program. But um, where is it? What does it look like, you know, and, and who's providing that type of housing? Very often that type of housing is substandard, frankly, you know, the slumlord situation. So um, I could see potentially branching into that area. Um, and I'll give you an example of another organization. If you've ever heard of the Fortune Society, uh, they're down in New York. They do amazing stuff with housing. They have a, a big facility that does transitional housing that's on the Upper West Side. Um, and then they also have developed um, permanent housing apartments that they then make available to people to transition out of there and have they have their own permanent solution you know if you can wait through the waiting list and get there um, and they do that through apartment units that they directly own and they also do what they call scatter site housing where they go out into the world and they rent housing under what they call like a master lease agreement and then they become the landlord for their um, uh, for their clients 
right? So they then sublease apartments to their clients. And in this way, they have inventory all over New York City where they can provide permanent a permanent housing solution. So I don't know if, if um, Hudson Link or New Beginnings will ever be involved in that um, phase of housing, but I can see the need for it. So um, we need to, that's something we need to talk about. So, you know, in a nutshell, I would like to see us focus more on evidence-based programs and look at um, what other phases of like this housing journey um, might need our attention the most, you know, as we look to the future. Um, could you elaborate on the types of, or the kinds of groups that help new beginnings with like fundraising? Like, are there any companies or organizations that donate? Yeah, um, I mean, the, the biggest chunks of money come from foundations. Um, most of the foundations are set up around um, personal or family fortunes. You know, so there's, um, there's a family that's based in Europe that has a, 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 a charitable foundation, you know, that, that they use um, as a vehicle for giving all over the world and they support us. There's um, uh, a family foundation in Mount Kisco that's been a New Beginnings biggest supporter. Um, that's the Kohlberg Foundation. Um, the Sunshine Lady Foundation is Warren Buffett's uh, sister's foundation. She recently passed away, but her foundation still um, exists uh, and still gives. Um, they've supported us. There's another family foundation called Morgbridge, Morgridge, something like that. It's a weird name. Um, so the biggest percentage of money is coming for us for this program now from um, large foundations. And most of them are built, are funded by individual or family wealth, right? Um, there, to a lesser extent, we've had some individuals, you know, personally, not through a foundation. We've had some faith communities, uh, churches and such, you know, that have, that have donated. Um, but the, the bulk of it has been um, big grants, bigger, you know, larger chunks of grants from um, family foundations. Okay. Now, um, the final question, because we, we're already, we're over time, but um, we don't want to waste any more of your time. I, I'm okay. As you can see, I'm home and the kids are watching TV. So oh, okay. but I know you guys have a life too. So don't don't worry about me, but if I, I understand if you guys okay. need to do something else. So what's the final question? Um, so how has this program impacted your life? How has it changed the way, you know, you live your life, the way you view the world? Wow. Um, all right. So the, for the first 10 years that I came after I came home, uh, I worked in the legal area. So I worked as a paralegal. Um, I had a lot of experience in law libraries when I was in prison. It was uh, a natural path for me as a way to come home and step into basically a white collar job where I could make a salary, you know, to pay my bills and um, have a family. Um, but in that industry, the way it works is you bill for your time. I would go to work every day. And if I was working for, let's say, seven and a half hours, I had to account for that seven and a half hours in six minute increments, right? So you bill for your time in point one, one tenth of an hour increments. So you'd have to account for your time every day, all day, so that somebody, some client would be paying, you know, for what you're doing. And, um, if you want to suck the fun out of life, just try doing that for about 10 years. So it was uh, one of the biggest differences for me when I changed gears and came to Hudson Link was just how different it felt driving to work in the morning. You know, the difference between essentially going to work to help somebody else get richer or going to work to um, help somebody else transition back to society and realize, you know, the best person that they could possibly be if they were given fair terms to do so, you know, um, and, and you just, I, I mean, the difference there is just huge. I mean, it's, 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 it's life changing um, just to be in a different position, to be able to go to work during each day to work towards something 
that is fully aligned with your personal values. You know, you just, I can't say enough about that. And, and then, you know, 75% of my coworkers are formerly incarcerated and are also doing this wonderful work. Like I don't have a lot of responsibility. I don't have a lot of contact uh, or involvement, I should say, with the educational aspects of Hudson Link, but I'm embedded with them. Like I'm working side by side with them on a day-to-day -day basis. And um, we're on the same page, you know what I mean? We're, we're, we've, most of us have been there. There's no question about, you know, like why we're here, what we're doing. You know, and, and um, that kind of alignment of values at work, I think, is also unique, you know, and, and um, it's the type of thing that's almost like self-reinforcing, like, you know, everybody is on the same page and on the same mission, and it, it helps to keep you focused and aligned. So um, the differences for me in doing this are huge. And now that the house is open, you know, I spend a lot of time directly interacting with and supporting the men that are there. And um, that's a whole new arena for me, but incredibly rewarding, you know, at the same time. You know, I've, I've been where they are, I've been in their shoes. I know what their potential is, and you just have to help them get there. I mean, it's very, it, it's very rewarding. That's, that's great. Um, it was a pleasure speaking with you today. We're going to write up a bio based off of this interview, and we will be emailing you soon whenever we you know, come together and finish it and okay. it's nice and polished. Um, so we're going to send it to you to like review it, see if everything's okay, if we interpreted everything correctly. Um, sure. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, and if you have any follow-up questions, you have my email. If you want to do it that way, we can call or, or Zoom again if we need to. It was a pleasure to meet you both. If you're getting graded on this, good luck. I hope you do well. Thank, Thank you, you so much. This was Thank so you. much, like, so much information. <laughs> I, I know. You're gonna, I hope you don't have a word limit because you're going to have trouble this time. <laughs> no. I know I talk a lot, so. No, I actually enjoy it. I love yeah. talking to people, like, you know, people older than me and just, like, learning things that I didn't know before, you know. It just gives you a lot of, you know, knowledge and things that you previously didn't know about. Yeah. So. Yeah. Well, I appreciate your interest, and I'm happy to talk to you guys. So good luck. Both Thank you. Have a good, Have night. good night. You too.